previous lecture you just watched was on sort of the long history of the European Reformation. And today we're going to get a little more specific and we're going to talk about exactly who are the Anglicans, the Puritans, and the Separatists. And uh, as you probably noticed in the last lecture, I, I do like to take some time to really focus on what it is they specifically believe. And uh, if you'll bear me with me one second, I'm going to explain to you why. You know, every historian, every teacher has certain components of history, certain aspects of the story uh, that they want to focus on more than others. And it's not that one is any more important. It's all interpretation. For some historians, it's uh, sociological factors and economic factors. For myself, in addition to what you're getting from the textbook, in addition to what you are getting uh, from the stuff we're reading, the films we're watching, I love cultural aspects of history, intellectual history, and as you've probably noticed, religious history. And one, because it's fascinating, it's important, it's a strain that we can follow all the way through the earliest elements of American history up into modern times. Also, as a point of analysis for you, I think it's important, considering the geopolitical realities of today, to be able to unpack people's beliefs, particularly beliefs that, are, that maybe are alien, that are separated from us geographically, culturally, and in this case, across the gaps of time. Uh, there's great value in that in understanding. That's one of the things we learn from history. So this will be our second lecture on this topic that will um, have somewhat of a theological focus in terms of trying to understand what it is that they actually believe, to, to put those beliefs in a place in time and sort of watch them move forward in history. The second thing I just want to remind you is for this set of lectures, uh, I've, I've supplied you with a lecture outline. It's a PDF form. It's the file attached to the folder where you found this lecture video. I, I just want to make sure that you have opened it. You at least are viewing it on the computer or somewhere else, or you have a printed copy. You know, it's, it's sort of an open outline, and I, I do expect you to fill in the gaps as I speak, the notes. It's sequential. It should make sense. Um, but you'll see that I'm expounding on things, and in order to answer the essay questions that go with the assignments with these lectures, you probably should take pretty good notes. Okay? All right, so let's start. So who are the Anglicans, uh, the Puritans, and the Separatists? And more importantly, what do they believe? We'll start with the Anglicans. You know, as we talked about, we ended the last lecture uh, talking about the formation of the Church of England. 1559, Queen Elizabeth I formally uh, institutes this new church, the Church of England, as the only acceptable Christian practice in England, 1559. And the Anglicans... Uh, is the term used to describe the mainstream uh, and at the time the majority of the members of the Church of England. Who are they though? What sort of people? Well, they would be wealthier, upwardly mobile urban dwellers in London. You'd find merchants, bankers, colonial investors, people involved in shipping, shopkeepers, sea captains. You would also see a lot of the landholding established aristocracy, the noble class. Uh, they're very often uh, the strongest leading members uh, of the Anglicans. They uh, politically are very closely aligned to uh, the king, particularly King James and King Charles in the early 17th century. Uh, they were very supportive of his royal court. What do they want from their religion? Listen, some of them are very pious, as we'd find in, in any religion. There are certain members who are very into spirituality and religion of all stripes. But by and large, they wanted, a, I don't know, what we might look at as a more typical religious experience, right? They, they, they saw a very compartmentalized way of sort of separating being people of the spirit and people of the world. They didn't think you could really combine them. And so you had separate times where you celebrated religion and spirituality in separate places, and then the rest of the time you engaged in the world in a practical way. And so basically, they had a certain ceremonial spirituality on Sundays in church. They celebrated feast days, particularly they loved Christmas. They loved to have a big festival around Christmas. Um, you know, they would sometimes merge secular enjoyment with a dash of spirituality on certain feast days. But as I said, they mostly saw their faith 
and their spirituality is something that, that's compartmentalized to place and time. You know, faith was to be found in a church during services and on religious holidays. Um, I should also say that religion for them also had a societal, societal role of adding legitimacy and solemnity to certain public institutions, like the coronation of a king was also partially a religious event. Marriages, right, which are civil institutions, but they were also, the Anglicans expected those to take place in a church. The, the religion gave it some solemnity and some authority and legitimacy. But the rest of the time, they didn't really want to be all that engaged in religion, right? Religion was Sunday and ceremony and holidays. The rest of the time, especially if we look at these sort of upwardly mobile, uh, dynamic city dwellers and the nobility and the political class, you know, they had to be, you know, people of the world. They had to pursue and compete in business and in politics and in policy. And, you know, they saw religion and spirituality as maybe not opposed to that, but just not something you could focus on all the time. And so the way religion works for them, they say, this is great. We'll make a nice, neat division. You put religion in one very specific area, and it's a lot of ceremony that kind of enshrines it. And the rest of the time, we're people of the world, right? You know, it's just this sort of basic idea that, that you couldn't always be holy or spiritual or saintly, okay? You just couldn't. So you had to have a place for that. And I should say, it wasn't that they weren't, they didn't subscribe to long-standing Christian morality and traditions in their general life. You know, the general norms of society then reflected the general norms of, of Christian morality everywhere. But as far as being spiritually active, finding meaning in their faith, it was separate. It was a separate time. They were people of the world and so, or people of the spirit, but never the same at the same time. You couldn't be both at the same time. And when we look at this, What's interesting, I've, considering the long history of the Reformation we talked about in the previous lecture, you know, the Anglicans and the Anglican Church came to be fairly similar to the Catholic Church that they had cast off a generation before. You know, the, much of the Catholic world at the same time, religion is the same sort of thing. Religion is for church. Religion is something we engage in spiritually when we're inside the church building, or it's for children, uh, and it's for feast days. Right? But the only people who could be in the Catholic world, and in the Anglican world too, spiritual all the time, are people who had rejected the world, right? People who became monks or uh, nuns who, who, you know, if you lived in an abbey or, or a convent, you could, could dedicate your whole life to spirituality. But you couldn't be both. You couldn't be worldly and spiritual. And even for uh, much of Catholicism at the time, that division was seen, that, that somehow engaging in the materialistic, political, public world w was inimical to spirituality. So you had to, to parse them out. It's interesting. And we see that Anglican practice, other than rejecting the authority of the Pope and having a married clergy, you know, the order of the Mass and its celebration and even the, the, the churches they built came to be pretty similar to Catholic churches and Catholic practice. Um, and it's not surprising considering that in many ways they wanted the same things from their religion as Catholics did at the same time. Now, this may sound really modern to you. You said, yeah, isn't that how modern religion works, right? That we have this sort of separation of, 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 of church life, spiritual life, and public life. But as I said, no. You know, that view of religion is actually really old. That is the way religion and spirituality worked in most societies at most times up to that point. That in fact, um, although we sometimes are taught to view what the Puritans believe and the Separatists believe as being pre-modern or backward, they actually latch on to something that is exceedingly modern, that has a huge influence on their time and modern time understandings of spirituality and faith. And I'm going to go over those now. First of all, we have to talk about who are the Puritans and the Separatists. First, they're very closely related, right? They had actually almost almost exclusively the same theological beliefs. All right, so when I talk about the theological beliefs, it applies for separatists and Puritans alike. But specifically, we'll talk about the Puritans on who they were. They're members of the Church of England, just like the Anglicans, right? They consider themselves equal members of the Church of England. Uh, they, they were proud and supportive of the church that Elizabeth creates in 1559. The problem is, 
they thought that the church as it existed, this Church of England, was corrupt, was immoral, was lax and lazy, right? It was far too Catholic in its forms and its attitudes. And, you know, they had this desire to purify or purge out what they saw as sort of heinous and awful Catholic elements from this church and to make the Church of England a more active, radical, um, official Protestant style church. And I, I should say this as an aside, and, and I once long, long ago uh, was at a, uh, a conference with a lot of British historians and was roundly chastised, one historian in particular, and you can read his work, it's excellent, Peter Lake hates the word Puritan because as he points out, and it's, it's, right, it's mostly true, they didn't call themselves Puritan, right? Puritan is actually what their detractors called them. Um, if you had met a Puritan at that time, they would have referred to themselves as an English Christian, right? And a member of the Church of England, and if they were more specific, they would have referred to the best of those among them as saints. And we're going to talk about this in a little bit of detail because they didn't mean saint the same way certain religions mean uh, a, a certain holy or inspired or miraculous figure. They meant saint as a, an everyday way of living. Particularly they had this term a visible saint. Visible saint. We will come back to that. The separatists. So what are the separatists? Well the separatists uh, has shared the same theological ideas as the Puritans. The separatists came up with a, a, a different view of themselves. They said, you know what? The Church of England, dominated by Anglicans, is so corrupt, so not Protestant, we just can't be part of it at all. We'll never be able to reform that church or purify it. Uh, you know, because the king and the crown themselves support that church. You know, the powers that be won't let us reform it. And so they choose to, as the name implies, separate from the Church of England. They formally declare themselves as something different. And there's not one large group called separatism. It's many, many small groups. You might just find uh, all over Southeast England in these farming communities, one community would establish its own separate church and they would practice religion their own way, formally rejecting the Church of England. And right from the very start, the separatist group suffers real uh, institutional and official opprobrium and persecution because the laws of England at the time say clearly there can only be one church. The only official legitimate form of Christianity is the Church of England as laid out under Elizabeth and future kings would support this. The Puritans had good cover because they said, yeah, we act differently, but we're members of the Church of England. We're just trying to fix it. The separatists had no political cover at all in the beginning, and they really are. Their leaders are arrested, their churches are, they attempt to disband them. In the early 17th century, many of them will leave. Whole communities up and leave. The first place they go is to the Netherlands. They go to Leiden, they go to Holland. Uh, the Netherlands had a very tolerant society, particularly to towards radical Protestant faiths. Uh, they will spend some time living there. And one small group after living in Leiden will in 1620, and of course this is the, the people we refer to as the Pilgrims, come over on the Mayflower and set up Plymouth Plantation, a colony here in America. And what we should remember is how fiercely independent they are. They're this little small colony that will remain independent, independent from larger Massachusetts Bay or Connecticut or any other colony up until the 1690s when uh, there's a big reorganization that's kind of forced on them and they're forced to join. But the separatists, much smaller group than the Puritans, will always have this kind of fierce, independent sort of strain, this sort of resistance to institutionalized authority, which remains in New England. They do, that does feed into New England religious, political, and social culture. But that's a subject for future lectures, just so we know who the separatists are. So what specifically do the Puritans and the separatists believe? And in order to understand that, we have to talk about, um, really, theologically speaking, the most important figure and theologian of the Protestant Reformation. Uh, we didn't talk about him very much in the Reformation lecture, but I'm going to talk about him now, and that's John Calvin, whose picture is behind me right now. John Calvin. So who is John Calvin? Um, a lot of people think he's Swiss, and we'll talk about why people think that. He wasn't. He's French. 
He's a French scholar, a humanist, someone who was, as a young man, was very interested in studying the classics. He learned Greek. He wrote treaties on Greek scholars. Uh, this is an intellectual movement moving throughout Europe at the time. <clears throat> he goes through a religious conversion, and he lived between, I, I should tell you, 1509, says it on your sheet of paper, to 1564. And somewhere in the 1530s, early 1530s, he does. He becomes really turned on by the Protestant movement that is, that is sweeping all of Europe at this time. And, you know, Calvin will write and craft the first really thorough, really complete theological work of Protestantism to define what it is, how to behave like a Protestant, Protestant how to set up your churches. And it is called the Institutes of Christian Religion the Institutes of Christian Religion. In fact, it's something he writes multiple times. The first copy, I think he puts it out in 1536, and he'll revise it many times as he changes his mind and expands his understanding. And I think the last authoritative copy is 1559. So what is this Institute of Christian Religion? Well, it is basically a theological guidebook to teach people how to actually create and forge a godly community here in this world, right? How do we actually set up a godly Protestant community? What will be the rules? How should we live? How should we interact? What should guide us? And he writes it down. It is, it's a self-help book for communities that want to be more Protestant, basically. And basically, he puts forth one of my, my favorite phrases that really sets the Puritans apart, the phrase, visible saints. And it tells you a lot of what you need to know about Calvin. He didn't just want people to be saintly. He had this idea of visibility, that our actions and how we live will determine how Christian we really are. It's not just contemplation and prayer, right? That Christianity and how we live in these communities are active communities. And they meant really moral action that other people could see, you could detect, you could measure, you could punish if it wasn't active enough or correctly focused, that your sainthood should be visible, detectable to all who see you, and not just you, the individual, your whole community, that anyone who should stumble upon a Calvinist-styled Protestant community would tell by their actions, the way people comport themselves, their general everyday laws, where they place their values instantly, visibly, empirically, and this is important because he's a humanist, he cares about things we can detect in this world empirically, you'll know that these are godly people. And more importantly, for Calvin, he thought that would inspire you. You would be drawn to these actions, the tightness of these communities. So this is a key idea for Calvin, this idea of visible sainthood. And, it's bar and the Puritans will literally, and to great lengths, try to recreate this idea in their communities of being visible saints. They, they use that term. But there's a second thing that, that comes out of this. So this visible sainthood is important, this sort of active communal Christianity that Calvin lays out. But more importantly, he comes up with this idea, he, he offers something up that frankly the Anglicans didn't want. Uh, in fact, it's the exact opposite of what the Anglicans want for the, from their religion and most Catholics as well. He comes up with a way to merge together at all times being people of the spirit and people of the world, right? That for Calvin, you don't have to separate these things. In fact, a godly visible saint always merge them, right? So that even when you're engaged in for-profit market farming and trying to get the best price, or you're raising your children, or you're dealing with a dispute with your neighbor, or you are in church at all times, the, the worldliness of your life and the spirituality of your life operate together. They're not inimical to one another. They're not counter-opposed. In fact, if you are living truly as a visible active saint, it is in your actions they will be wed. Because for Calvin, it's not a contemplative world where you have to change the way you think. It's the way you act that matters. And since you're going to act the same in church and you will act the same and have the same values outside of church, they naturally merge together. And this is the, the foundational principles of, of Calvin's Institute of Christian Religions. It's the foundation principles of many modern Protestant movements all the way through. And like I should say, why I say this is modern is, uh, in many ways this flies against long-standing, not just Christian, Eastern, Asian, 
sub-Saharan African ideas of spirituality, right? Where to be truly spiritual, you had to reject the material, reject worldliness. The Catholics say that, right? All the Catholic saints are people who leave, they, they, at least for some part of their lives, become ascetics or deny themselves. You know, the Anglicans felt the same way. They weren't as interested in denying themselves anything. They were happy with their middle ground. But if you really did want to be spiritual, whether you're the Buddha or a, a, a Hindu mystic, there's a sort of rejection of, of material worldliness and spirituality. It's that dualism. Well, Calvin wants a this world religion. He's a humanist. He wants individuals to act in the real world and have connection to the divine world at the same time, right? And Calvinism affords people the chance to do that. And that's why I say it's modern, right? It doesn't seem modern. When we look at old movies that sort of condemn the, the clannishness and the uber uh, moral censorious nature of the Puritanism, we say, what a bunch of old fashioned guys. And in that sense, sure mores have changed. But in terms of how religion operates in everyday life, right, and how it has any meaning, this idea of being spiritual or, or religious everywhere and still being people of the world, that's a modern sensibility. That's what John Calvin gives to the world. And it comes to this part of the world, the new world, through the Puritans and the separatists who settle here. A couple key other beliefs that go with John Calvin, right? Um, he believes, of course, in the centrality of Scripture, right? And this is true for almost all Protestants, that, that knowledge of God does not come from churches or masses or priests. It doesn't come from ceremonies or celebration, right? It comes directly from the Bible, the inspired Word of God, right? And so, like all Protestants, he's a big believer in literacy and the printing of the Scripture in the language of the people, right? It wasn't written in Latin. You should translate the Bible into common tongues, and everyone should be able to read, right? And he's, the Puritans, uh, as we'll see in America, you know, they have close to 95% literacy by the middle of the 17th century. I mean, that's, uh, that's an astounding literacy rate, not for the 17th century, for the 21st century, right? I mean, that's really impressive. That's part of Calvinism. It's part of all Protestantism, truthfully. Um, another thing that he did is Calvin didn't just write about this. And this is what makes Calvin interesting. He actually put his faith into practice. He creates an actual godly community that becomes this worldly city, and it's called Geneva, which is still a city, right? It's in Switzerland. In the German part of Switzerland, we have Geneva. And Calvin moves there in the, in the early uh, 1540s, and over time, his brand of Christianity uh, becomes the dominant Geneva, and he himself becomes the dominant political, cultural, and religious force of Geneva. And Geneva becomes this city of visible saints, governed on these Calvinist principles of this active Christianity, where Geneva is, uh, has huge markets, there are a lot of wealthy people there engaged in business, right? They have no problem being worldly and hardworking, but they're always striving for a certain level of morality, like they had really strict religious laws as their civic laws, uh, you know, church is mandatory, right? They're, they're, they're Sabbatarians. There's all these aspects of Christianity that become not just spiritual separate laws, but they become the everyday laws, the part of everyday life. And for a while, Geneva's quite successful, both economically speaking, it's this independent city that does really well in Switzerland, but spiritually speaking, people flock from all over to come see, religious people particularly come to study with Calvin and people who have studied with Calvin, and they go and they spread back around Europe, taking the Calvinist message and his institutes of Christian religion with him. Uh, specifically, in, in the, the late 16th and early 17th century, uh, major Scottish and English Protestant reformers go to Geneva. It's like the experience. You go to Geneva and they come back transformed. I and mean, they are hot and heavy with this. And it becomes, Calvinism becomes, they want to reform the Church of England and the model they want to use to reform the Church of England is this style of Calvinism, to create a worldly, godly community in this world, right? To live in a godly community all the time and still be active, not be a community of people who are reclusive or have removed themselves from materialism. Oh no, to actually participate in it, to be successful market farmers and to be these godly visible saints, inspirations to others through our actions, to all around them. I should say uh, Calvinism 
is, you know, Lutheranism, right, and Luther's, Luther's, as far as the people follow a direct Lutheran path, it's mostly just people in northern Germany and Scandinavia and people from the, uh, the uh, parts of the world who've migrated from those areas, right? It's very regionally and ethnically focused. Almost every other varietal of Protestantism, all the different sects, if you were to trace them back, trace back to Calvinism. I mean, it's Presbyterians, Congregationalists, Methodists, Quakers, uh, you know, uh, Anglicans and Episcopalians. It's everyone, even Ma Baptists, which is, you know, the largest uh, Protestant group in this country, or the Baptists, they all trace their roots back, their theological roots back to Calvin. What they believe has changed, but the model set forth by Calvin becomes the real weight of, of, of the Protestant Reformation, right? That's the one that really shapes the rest of the world. Luther gets the ball rolling, and there's no two ways about that. And in certain regions, Lutheranism is, is dominant. But globally speaking, most Protestant sects trace back to Calvin. Calvinism will be really popular among uh, the settlers, I'm sorry, the people who live in southeastern England, these farming people in Anglia, uh, and for lots of reasons. One, they have these very tight communities, and they're not just subsistence farmers making just enough to feed themselves. No, there has been this, this revolution in agricultural production that they are very successful market farmers. They grow all kinds of different foods from grains to mixed vegetables that they're not just selling in London, they're actually engaging in these global markets. You know, Europe, due to warfare and a host of other problems, has food issues, right? It's part of one of the reasons we've already talked about why they settle the new world is to help solve some of these food issue problems. These market farmers are making a killing. They're growing, they're a rising, mobile, wealthy group. And they're a tight community and they want a religion, right? That works with the tightness of their community, yet allows them to continue to be successful farmers, participate in these rational, far-reaching markets. And farmers are hardworking. Then, now, in the future, there are certain aspects, as we'll talk about with Puritanism and Calvinism, that really appeals to a dynamic farming community um, just because of their lifestyle. So specifically now, I'm going to go over what do the English Puritans and Separatists believe? What are their specific beliefs? And these are the beliefs that they have in England. They are the beliefs that they're going to take with them as they settle New England and Providence Island and Long Island. These beliefs will, one way or another, bleed and merge into larger American beliefs post-colonial. Not perfect and not in a straight line, right? But they're there. These are some of the foundational ideas that clearly shape contemporary American culture. All right? They're not the only ones, and depending on what aspect we're talking about, they're not dominant ones, but they're there. Okay? First and foremost, and this is true, again, just like the Anglicans, um, they're thoroughly anti-Catholic. Right? They have a political and cultural, um, you know, almost virulent hatred of Catholicism. Uh, and this is just how it is. And <clears throat> but they go beyond this. You know, they reject the Pope, they reject a married clergy, but they go much further than the Anglicans go, beyond the politics of it or the organization of the church. They have this extreme anti-iconography, anti-symbol movement. One of the things they hate about the Anglican church is that it has altars, the priests wear vestments, they have stained glass windows. In fact, the churches start to look like Catholic churches. They detest this. They say that icons, and imagery is Catholic. And what it does is it, it creates an interference between uh, individuals encountering the scripture, right? That they want no blocks between an individual's ability to, to confront and know Christ in their lives. And that all the icons and stuff is a distraction and it's popery, right? And so that's one of the things they really are, they're iconoclast, means they like to destroy <laughs> icons and symbols and statuary. And that's one of the big things. And another idea that is affiliated with Catholicism, according to the Puritans, um, is this idea of good works. And the gospel of good works kind of works like this. It's the idea that by doing good things, bestowing kindness on others, you know, visiting the sick and helping the poor and giving alms, you know, what we all recognize as, as, as moral good active works. There was a belief that, you know, you do that, that's what makes you a good person. And that's how you receive God's grace. That's how your soul is saved and you go on into the next life to, to live eternally with God. The Puritans hate that concept. 
They say it's illogical. They say human beings are fundamentally flawed through original sin. We're all depraved. And nothing we do, no action, no good work, no matter how good you think you are, undoes how imperfect we are, right? We are all fit to be damned, and we're born that way, according to them. And this idea that you could do good works to win God's favor, that's a human concept. To them, it's an illogical concept, right? With this omniscient, omnipotent God, he does, you can't good work your way into his faith, into his grace. And in fact, they say just the opposite. For reasons that human beings cannot understand, will never understand, God freely chooses to bestow his grace on some individuals and not others. And no action, no work we do in this world, right, no good work can change that, right? And so they're always on the look for this sort of gospel of good works and striking it down, right? Because it goes against their very fundamental belief about human depravity and original sin and God's freedom chooses us, not the other way around. You know, Anglicanism, one of the reasons the Puritans condemn it is some of the um, dogma and lecturing of the time of Anglican ministers toys with this idea of good works, encouraging people to be good in order to win God's grace. And the Puritans are very hypersensitive to this. So that's how they're anti-Catholic. Um, here's another idea they had. They wanted to make these sort of perfect communities of visible saints. And because of that, they had this idea. They said, listen, our communities and churches are not open to everybody. If you are not a visible saint, if you are not a good person or someone that God has chosen to have grace, you can't be more part of our community. They would drive you out. They said, you know, you have to be, they called it being regenerated. You had to be a regenerate, right? You had to have your original sin removed through God's grace. Because they said, it's illogical or crazy to have a church if ungodly people can be in it. Especially uh, degenerate people who are open and proud sinners, they obviously want to know part of that. But this goes beyond the idea of merely people professing that they're good. Because remember, they're Calvinists. They want visible sainthood. They want to be able to see and detect signs that you are among the saved. In fact, they had a word for this, right? It's called the elect, that, that God before you're even born, because God is all-knowing and he's all-powerful, and time doesn't matter for God. He already knows everything that's going to happen and everything that's happened before. So he must know ahead of time who is saved, right? And he must choose them ahead of time. Before your birth, some are chosen to be saved and others are not. For reasons we don't understand, but who are we to question God is the way the Puritans saw it. And they called these guys the elect. And this very concept is called predestination, right? That you are, no matter how many good works you do in your life, no matter what else you do, it is predestined whether or not you've received God's grace and your soul will be united with him after you die in heaven, or whether you're going to be eternally damned, right? And there's no, you can't choose to make one happen and not the other. It is predestined. And as I said, um, the Puritans are empiricist. They are constantly looking for signs of who the predestined are. Because I should say, here's the big question every student is always asked when introduced with the concept of predestination. Why be good? If it's already decided before you were born that you were going to go to heaven or not, and nothing you do or choose to do makes you go to heaven, gets God's grace or not, well then here's a big question. Why be good? Why not just sin and enjoy life with and, and not put yourself through the rigor of being a Puritan, right? If it's all predestined, well, the Puritans and Calvin didn't think God was crazy, right? They thought God was very logical, right? And so clearly, God wouldn't, you know, the people who have God's grace wouldn't be the sinners. They wouldn't be the degenerates. As a matter of fact, the people who have God's grace, the elect, will be evident in this world. Remember, there's no separation between the spiritual world and the concrete world for them. We should be able to see active signs in their behavior, in their moral standards, in their style of worship, in how they carry themselves in every aspect of life, from when they're in church, to when they're doing business, to how they deal with their neighbors, how they deal with their children, how they deal with their spouses. There will be constant signs that will tell us whether or not you are among the elect. And that's this idea of visible sainthood, right? That you could see it. And so they constantly were looking at one another. Literally, they wanted to see and judge each other's behavior. And 
what goes along with that is this idea of punishment, right? That every Puritan community felt that they had to have the ability to not only observe your behavior, but they also had to have the ability to correct and punish your behavior as a community, right? Because that's what they, they, they have a, a Skinnerian view of the world because they wanted to say, even though you may have signs of the elect, we have this heavy weight of original sin. Human beings are so corrupt that without constant correction, we backslide into degeneracy, into sin. And so it was very important that to sustain this community of visible saints, you had to have discipline and the power of the community to discipline the individual within the context of the church and outside of the context of greater law. Now, Calvin's Geneva made it a matter of law that they could discipline you, right? The Puritans do this themselves, they have this style of church discipline. Um, and, you know, American history and early American history, is a lot of talk about the styles of Puritan discipline. But this is an important concept for them. Another idea that, that uh, really plays into this idea of worldliness is there were certain aspects of worldly behavior that are moral in and of themselves. And I'll tell you, two of them that really worked for the Puritans, and it's, it, it, it's what I would say the truly modern view of religion. It's, 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 it's that point in time when you can almost start merging you know, certain capitalist ideas with spiritual ideas that Calvin says, and he just says it, and the Puritans believe it, God loves hard work, physical, actual hard work. And not only does he love hard work, he loves ingenuity. He loves enterprise. He loves when your hard work isn't just you digging a ditch and getting paid and going home. No, he loves it when you plan ahead, when you turn something, a piece of land, not only into a productive farm that can feed you through your hard work, you actually can make money on it. You engage rationally in a larger growing market and you increase your wealth. You do something more productive in life. You know, it's that like parable of the talents. They really love this idea. Specifically, and this is great for this growing market community. That's who these guys are. They're these guys who really do work hard. Puritans, for all the faults they may have or have not had, the one thing nobody could say about a Puritan family is that they were lazy. They're the hardest working people on earth. Uh, you know, 60, 70 hours a week of hard farm labor for the entire family. And not just to feed themselves, but actually they had foresight, right? They wanted to make money. And that making money off of hard work and ingenuity was seen as godly, was seen as a sign of the elect, that those who were successful doing things in that sort of godly disciplined way and actually could make a decent living doing it were probably also among the elect. This came under the concept of Christian morality. It's probably the central way that they wedded being people of the spirit with being people of the world. And it was offset by this. They didn't think it was good to make money anyway, right? If you were a cheat, if you were lazy, if you did something immoral, right? They really actually hated that, right? They didn't say it, was, it wasn't just about making the money. It was this sort of uh, kind of three part where you had hard work and discipline. You disciplined your life, you did the hard work, you had some foresight and, foresight and you turned you know, something that was nothing, a, a plot of land, into something that increased the wealth of your family and generations afterwards. I mean, this is the ultimate model. And to be honest, this model didn't just appeal to the Puritans, right? And it does appeal to them. It appealed to Thomas Jefferson, right? It appeals to the entire early national period that there's something noble, otherworldly, great about the hardworking farmer who does through their hard work as a family or community not only feeds themselves but is able to engage nobly and productively right in a market and make money by selling their surplus this is a value held today that some work is better than others we very often place a certain amount of um, nobility on this exact pursuit we subsidize family farms on the federal level because we do have this sort of idealized vision that this is a valuable thing. It is a just and right and godly and moral and fulfilling communal way to, to go about your daily business. And so this is really important to the Puritans. And they have these ideas. These are the ideas that they bring with them as they come across you know, uh, on boats and settle New England, settle Providence Island, settle Long Island. And just real quickly, two things I want to say. So 
what was the appeal of these communities, right? Why did people want to join these rigorous communities that were far more rigorous spiritually, personally, socially, uh, and morally than being part of an Anglican community, right? Why put yourself through this? Why submit yourself to, to the discipline of a community if you weren't godly enough? Well, why do people join religious communities now or any point in history or any sort of ideologically driven community, right? There's something psychologically satisfying when you tie yourself together to uh, a hard to reach goal that you're all in together. And as I said, you know, it did make them more productive. They, did, they were successful. It worked with their lifestyle. You know, people are always trying to struggle to find meaning. Today, in the 17th century, in the 18th century, that struggle for meaning. We can all be productive. We can all engage in the world. We can do well in certain things. But there is a human desire, and I posit that it's a historically relevant human desire to tie all the things we do together in some sort of unified, meaningful ideology or spirituality or philosophy. And Puritanism gave these growing market farmers of England and, and, and Scotland and then later in America, the perfect ideology, the perfect communal structure that they could be belong to something that gave them great psychological and spiritual solace. And it should be noted, not only did it work for them psychologically, the Puritans, again, for all of their faults, are phenomenally successful. You know, they launch and win the two most significant revolutions of the 17th and 18th centuries, if you come right down to it. They do go on to become quite influential politically. Uh, they become wealthy compared to the rest of the world. I mean, this ideology, religious, whatever its source, did bind them together in a way that did increase their status and their psychological strength on two continents. So this is why it had great appeal. I want to do one other real quick thing just so we're clear. Uh, it actually may not even be all that quick. I'm just going to go over the quick political history of Puritans in England, okay? Because uh, I just want you to have what's happening when, okay? So first, and I'm going to do it by monarch, right? So the last of the Tudor monarchs, Elizabeth I, right? She reigns from 1558 to 1603. This is the birth of Puritanism in England. And truth to tell, Elizabeth is pretty soft on the Puritans. She doesn't mind them. She doesn't do much to curtail their numbers. Um, she's happy to not getting, you know, the reason why they create the Church of England is because she doesn't want to get involved in religious civil disputes. She figures it's a good compromised church, as we talked about in the last lecture. It makes everybody happy, and she wants to focus more on international issues and growing the strength of England as an international player. So under th this period of time, 1558 through 1603, we see a boom in Puritanism, right? This is really the great period of growth in England and in Scotland of, uh, of people who will follow this style of, of faith community formation. Particularly in the southeast of England. Another thing that happens during this time is the Puritans uh, begin to produce intellectuals. Many of the British and English Puritan intellectual leaders will come into existence during this time, and they won't only be influential in these Puritan communities, they actually take over the theological schools of Oxford and Cambridge. You know, every minister in the Anglican Church, right, has, is trained through Oxford and Cambridge. And many of the professors and the teachers there in the divinity schools subscribe to this Puritan belief. It's not surprising. It's the more rigorous and um, dogmatic belief that has a scholar who's created it. So it had great appeal to the divinity school in Oxford and Cambridge. So slowly but surely, uh, the, the ministers, right, the, the people on the ground, become more and more Puritan all throughout the Anglican church during this time. The next monarch begins the Stuart line, as we know, and that's James I. And James I will rule from 1604 to 1625. He'll begin a crackdown on Puritanism. He doesn't like the Puritans um, for a number of reasons, right? But one of the reasons is uh, he doesn't like their growing power. He has, he's trying to smooth over England's relationship with the world, so he becomes much closer, ends you know, uh, centuries of warfare with Spain, a Catholic power. 
Puritans may come to dominate the ministers in the parishes, but James I makes sure that every bishop, the people actually governing each parish, is an Anglican, a good, solid, royally supporting Anglican. And he begins to actually persecute and attempt to outlaw certain styles of Puritan worship. Like if they're running a church in a certain way, they actually do arrest certain ministers. They come in and say, nope, you have to do your worship more in the style of the high Anglican mass. And of course, what happens, and you know, this is true today and in other times, often when you start to persecute a religion or a religion feels that it has an oppositional relationship, right, or your beliefs have an oppositional relationship with some sort of power structure, it actually radicalizes them. It makes them more aggressive. And they go from merely being a faith community to being this sort of really politically active community that sees themselves and their uh, religion as something they need to spread to all of England, that it needs to merge itself with the governance of England. And so Puritan leaders take on this far more active political role. And during the reign of King James, they will actually insert themselves into politics. In fact, Puritans will come to dominate Parliament. Parliament is the elected body that is responsible for taxation. Um, you know, the king has to call it into, ses in, into session anytime he wants to raise money, right? And the Puritans come to dominate it on the ground. So James's actions, um, instead of squashing Puritanism or limiting that style of faith, actually radicalizes it and gives them this sort of nationalistic um, uh, political bent. He'll die. He'll be succeeded by his uh, son, Charles I. And, you know, Charles will rule 1625 until his death in 1649. He doubles down on the persecution of the Puritans. He actually appoints a new archbishop called Archbishop Laud, L-A-U-D, uh, and gives him really the sole task of not being a spiritual leader, but of eliminating Puritanism within the churches and helping him to eliminate the Puritan influence in political society. Uh, he goes to ra rather extreme means to eliminate the Puritans. In fact, in 1629, he disbands Parliament, or he refuses to call it into session. And he rules for the next uh, over 10 years without Parliament at all, just a king. And this is a big sea change in English po political history. He becomes more of an absolute monarch um, and because of this, the next 10 years, we get these really hardened lines of the wealthy and the landed aristocracy and the upwardly mobile urban dwellers and merchants uh, aligning themselves with the Anglican church and politically with the king and the countryside and the sort of dynamic market farmers becoming hardened in their Puritan stance and hardened as political opponents. And this will all boil over in 1642 into an outright civil war. It is the English Civil War. And it goes on until 1649 when Charles is defeated and in fact he's beheaded, right? He's actually executed. And his, his, his wife and his children flee to France. And England for uh, the next 10 years comes under the domination of Oliver Cromwell. Now, Oliver Cromwell was a military leader and an ardent zealot uh, Puritan. Uh, he's an innovative military leader. He actually creates something called the New Model Army. The New Model Army is the British Army we're all familiar with, that highly disciplined three rows of, of, of soldiers and a very organized. That's his thing. The Puritans, as we know, very into discipline and community organization. And they create a style of, of uh, soldiering that defines the British Empire for the rest of time. But I should say, for this 10 years, England kind of becomes a Geneva, right? Oliver Cromwell will rule almost as a military dictator. He'll impose Puritan laws across the land. It's called the Protectorate at the time. He gets rid of all royalist um, forms. Domestically, he outlaws dancing and swearing and makes mandatory church service, closes bars. I mean, he's, you know, he's a very hardcore uh, Puritan moralist. Internationally, he actually increases England's power. He boosts up its navy, launches a war against the Dutch, which he is very successful in, um, grows the size of its army. He invades Ireland because there's a rebellion there that he absolutely crushes and, and uh, you know, destroys almost every church and abbey in Ireland in this almost holy war. And, and, and well over a million people die in Ireland under Oliver Cromwell. And this is, is still a sore point for many Irish. But this is the world just to give you what happens with Puritanism, right? And this is where this lecture is going to end. 
the key things I just wanted you to remember is I wanted you to really have an understanding of who the Puritans are and the Anglicans and the Separatists. What is it that they really believe and how it operates for them, why they believe it. And if you understand that, if you can sort of unpack who they are across time and history, you'll be able to see and, and judge and analyze how they operate here in America, their own history. And I do believe that having some of these analytical skills, historically, theologically, culturally, has value now. Okay? I, it's, it's a useful way of, of viewing and, and working to understand cultures and religions that maybe are alien in this time as well. And of course, I wanted you to have a, just a brief grasp of the political, the quick political history of Puritanism uh, in England. I know it's also in the text. I just wanted to reinforce that for you. So uh, this lecture is over. Thank you.